Good afternoon, Good ladies afternoon. and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Asavri Savan, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the second episode of Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia Talk. On behalf of Voice of Healthcare, this session is being supported by Dr. Wilma Shaw. As we are all aware, dementia is a syndrome that causes deterioration in cognitive function. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, contributing up to 70% of total dementia cases. We at VOH recognize that until a definitive cure is found, care and awareness remain the most effective solutions to counter the dual conditions. For today's talk, Voice of Healthcare brings leading minds and experts together on this exclusive session. The title of this talk is Recent Advances and Future Treatment Options for Alzheimer's Disease. <coughs> now, please let me welcome our esteemed speakers, Dr. Praveen Gupta, Principal Director and Head, Department of Neurology at Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurugram. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Sanjeev Jha, Professor, Department of Neurology at SGPGIMS, Lucknow. Welcome, sir. Dr. Sumit Kumar, Consultant of Neurology at Regency Healthcare, Kanpur. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Anil Kumar Jha, Senior Consultant of Neurology at Paris HMRI Hospital, Patna. Welcome, sir. And Dr. Sanjay Kumar Chaudhary, Senior Consultant of Neurology at IBS Hospitals, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. Dr. Chaudhary will also be moderating today's talk. It is said that no milestone is impossible when we aim for it together. So without further ado, let's begin today's session. Over to you now, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Asavadi, for uh, welcoming an uh, eminent galaxy of neurologists from northern India. And uh, we'll start this brief, uh, I would call it continuing medical education, but it's basically spreading awareness about Alzheimer's disease and dementia to the general public. And uh, welcome to this uh, talk show, in which we will ask questions from the eminent neurologist. Uh, my first question about <coughs> use the terms Alzheimer's disease and dementia almost in a similar fashion as if both because Alzheimer's disease forms 70% of all cases of dementia. Now, the first question goes to Professor Sajeev Jha from SGPG sir. What are the common symptoms which we can relate to the disease? How can a lay person find out whether the person has dementia or Alzheimer's disease? Sir, what do you? Hmm. Uh, Dr. Sanjay and others, a very good afternoon to you all. First of all, let, let me clarify why I am joining the session. The main reason why I am joining the session is I want to share my experience and observation. Am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. You are Am clear, I, sir. I just want to share my experience and observations regarding certain important essential aspects of dementia versus Alzheimer's. So I'm just sharing my experience rather than in copy books and book studies. So I rather just sharing what I have experienced for the last forty years in the observation of patients of dementia. The most important thing is for all of us to realize, including patients and caregivers, and physicians and people, that dementia is not a disease. It is not a disease. It is a syndrome. It is a syndrome. And I have intellectual impairment. It is a syndrome. And I have intellectual impairment. By first, in at least three or four of the players, 
that is memory language cognitive function with special attention emotional status in person so three things i want to emphasize number one acquire persistence for example we have a few of what we can do सिंगोम acquired persistent intellectual impairment the most characteristic thing about dementia was the element of memory loss and the common symptom we see all know is our block memory they will make calculation error they go to the lender and make calculation error either to overpay or underpay or sometimes they forget to pay or sometimes they all the money to the Vendor, the second common thing that we have observed is that normally they don't, they the patients don't have any complaint. It is only the attendants and caregivers who come back from the hospital who are being detained or something similar. The worst part about everything is that shrink memory, like date of marriage, date of birth, shrink memory is very resistant to the effect of. and this is very 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 important to the in the diagnosis of dementia dementia patient have a very loss of sensory memory in a very sort of very late stage in dementia and this is very important to the caregiver what is the you remember the date of his birthday the marriage anniversary the number the number of his great grandfather and what he was about in his life That is normal, but that, they know what, what they forget is that actually memory is very important to the person. So the most important thing is that memory loss occurs, uh, progressive, which is progressive, intellectually progressive. Uh, you know the other common other symptom which I have observed. Now these are very common things we all know. Most people who have memory is the that. Then the loss of biological rhythm is greatly lost in sleep. Loss of biological rhythm, all the other, especially sleep area rhythm. They wake up in the middle of the night, asking for dinner. So by the time they come for dinner, they are not coming. Right? So loss of sometimes they they are not aware what they are doing. How much is eating? This time it's fine. This time you know it's fine. A child doesn't know how much he is eating or how much he is eating. Uh, and uh, they don't realize they are still eating, eating a couple. Of, they develop hyperphagia, and as for the hyperphagia, they develop a lot of vomiting. So vomiting. <coughs> Sometimes they keep drinking water, without realizing that now they are full. So these are the very common symptoms. Uh, the hallmark of which is sometimes the most important uh, time when the patient realizes that the patient is having something serious is that. Uh, commonly, all these symptoms are dismissed off as being "Hey, sir, he is all old age, all old age." "Hey, sir, sati aage, sati aage." They uh, they become concerned when the patient loses his way back home. They go to the office, then they forget uh, where, what is the lane which they have to follow. They forget. They start wandering from here to there, and they are commonly uh, sent uh, here, <coughs> picked up by somebody. Known to them, who bring them, that sir, he was not able to recollect where, what his house number and all is. They lose the way back home. So these are very common symptoms of uh, dementia, and they are relentlessly progressive, right? Yes, about the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Now, uh, my next question is to. Dr. Anil Kumar Jha from Paras Patna Hospital. Uh, what are the various risk factors which are associated with Alzheimer's disease? So, can you elaborate so people can pick up these risk factors and get 
easy uh, assessment and treatment done. Thank over to Dr. Anil. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a galaxy of uh, neurologists. So uh, I will uh, like to, you know, uh, uh, try to make uh, the risk factors which are easily perceivable to our uh, common people so that they yes. understand the, which are the people who are uh, more prone to Alzheimer's disease and uh, the, the leading cause of dementia all over the world. Definitely in our country, the scenario is slightly different, as Sir yeah. already said. But the most important risk factors that we should be aware of are only few. And definitely uh, Alzheimer's uh, is a uh, late onset uh, um, uh, disease mostly, but there are few early onset Alzheimer's also. But the most important risk factor is definitely the age. So age becomes the most important risk factors. And also there are other important risk factors like genetic risk factors. There are particular few particular genes which are identified with the Alzheimer's like presenalin one, two. I will not go into the details because, because most of our neurologists are well versed and rather they're experts in this area. But the basic thing is that there are few genetic factors uh, which are, uh, you know, very, very important in the, uh, especially in the young onset uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Also, uh, sometimes it is said that the low level of education and then the physical activity or the physical performance who have poor, they are also prone to have Alzheimer's disease. There are numerous other genetic factors also, as I said. Sometimes it is said that hypertension can also be a risk factor, especially in the early onset Alzheimer's disease, but not in the late onset. Although that is a slightly debatable uh, thing that whether it is an Alzheimer's disease uh, or more it's a vascular dementia things because there are few criteria to diagnose Alzheimer's and vascular. But as such it is also considered to be a uh, risk factors. Apart from that any major medical illness or neurological illness, some psychiatric illnesses, even vitamin deficiency particularly B6 and B12 deficiencies and then is major surgeries, repeated head traumas, or even the substance abuse. So these are some of the important risk factors that are uh, we uh, see that different trials also suggest, though there are few controversies related to the risk factors. But overall, I would say that the most important risk factors are few genetic factors and the age. So most of the times they are non-modifiable risk factors, but there are few which are modifiable. So that is uh, in a nutshell, the overall picture regarding the risk factors in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Tranil, uh, for uh, elucidating all the important risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now I will move to the next speaker. Dr. Praveen Gupta, he is from Portis Gurgaon. He will be uh, answering as to how to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Is it mainly clinical or as in India, because we are a third world uh, developing country, are there are non-clinical uh, tools easily available in India? And what are the importance of early detection in uh, Alzheimer's disease? How we can help the patients more? Over to you, Dr. Praveen, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. You have asked a very relevant question. As you said yourself, Alzheimer's disease or dementia is largely a clinical diagnosis and tests may not be greatly helpful. As Dr. Jha had elucidated, even the earliest symptoms like forgetting names or searching for words when trying to recollect the name of a thing like pen, glass of water are the first cues that a person has for Alzheimer's disease. The difference between Alzheimer's disease and a normal forgetfulness that comes with age is that it is progressive and it interferes with your daily quality of life. So it is a part of the definition of dementia that forgetfulness should be progressive and to of such an account that it starts interfering with activities of daily living. So when the patient presents to the doctor, we can do a test called MMSC, which is a simple bedside test which will tell us whether there is significant cognitive impairment or not. Then there are scales available which a psychologist can administer 
the multiple dementia skills are there which can be administered to establish the presence of cognitive impairment and then to find out which lobe of the brain or which part of the brain is maximally affected we can do a number of blood tests depending upon the age of the patient in young patients a larger series of tests is required because a large numbers of reversible dementias are possible like substance abuse alcoholism vitamin deficiencies uh trauma to the brain but uh, at least a ct head should be done at all ages because it will tell us whether there is a gross injury to the brain there is presence of some tumor in the brain or some new hemorrhage like subdural hemorrhage is present in the brain which is mimicking dementia in cases where it is accessible and where money is not a problem we can do a mri of the brain also for better understanding of brain mri sometimes may show atrophy in certain parts of the brain like temporal lobe frontal lobe to give us some clue to dementia and other times it is normal mri is done more to rule out other disorders than to establish the diagnosis of alzheimer disease or dementia if we still have doubt and money or finance is not a problem and we have accessibility to other tests we can do a fdg brain pet which can clearly show us hypoperfusion of various parts of brains to help us establish the diagnosis in certain patients where infection of the brain is suspected like cjd or some other chronic infection we can test the brain water also but these are largely the tests along with biochemical tests like simple tests like blood count liver function kidney function thyroid b12 vitamin d so that we do not miss a treatable disorder so more or less this forms the larger list of testing for usual forms of dementia to my question thank you dr praveen for elaborate answer to my question now i'll move on to the next speaker dr sumit kumar he is from regency hospital kanpur as dr anil has already elaborated about the risk factors of uh, dementia and alzheimer's disease how can we reduce the risk factor for developing dementia can it be altogether prevented can it be delayed can the effects of dementia be minimized by intervening with the risk factors please over to dr sumit kumar uh, thank you dr sanjay i hope i am audible yes so as as the nicely elucidated by dr anil jha we we obviously have seen that there are some modifiable and non modifiable risk factors for alzheimer's disease obviously we cannot modify our genes uh, if at all genes are responsible for developing alzheimer's disease but there are uh, uh, a few modifiable risk factors which also lead to uh, alzheimer's disease and dementia though these are very debatable so one thing uh, which multiple studies have shown is that whatever risk factors that are present they are present in uh, we can say in mid life stage like in 50s and 40s and 60s so eventually these risk factors eventually in 70s and 80s may predispose uh, the patients to increased risk of alzheimer's disease so if we categorically see the treatment of alzheimer's disease we may not find anything related to diabetes hypertension or anything but actually if you want to prevent the development of alzheimer's disease later in the life so we have to uh, modify the risk factors in 50s 40s and 60s the middle ages so the most important risk factor uh, which i feel is is hypertension i think hypertension has been shown to lead to eventual uh, deposition of amyloid in various uh, blood vessels even in the brain so we can if during 40s 50s and the middle life if we, we can reduce the blood pressure to as uh, as feasible as it can be so hopefully in the longer run eventually there will be decreased risk of uh, alzheimer's disease apart from that all the risk factors which predispose to stroke or even mi all those risk factors eventually are also considered to be risk factors for uh, later stage development of alzheimer's disease so whether it is blood sugar whether it is dyslipidemia even if we see the treatment of alzheimer's disease there is uh, some uh, debate whether statin should be given or not or whether these drugs work or not but there are multiple studies which some have indirectly shown that uh, maybe there is some role of statin vitamin e and other drugs but the key is to whether there is some uh, 
final or some definite evidence or not that is debatable but if at all you want to have uh, any modification in this factor that has to be done in the younger ages so whether it is dyslipidemia blood pressure blood sugar these these risk factors should be treat, uh, cons considered during the early stage apart from that uh, uh, brain trauma is obviously one of the things which uh, are supposed to be some some sort of risk factor but these are something which if i especially in elderly population this can be avoided as uh, dr pravin also said that the the, uh, the patient comes and then there is a continuous uh, small subdural hematoma or something that is present uh another thing is uh, drugs i mean uh, especially in elderly population the uh, there are certain drugs which may uh, kind of uh, uh, suppose a patient is having uh, not very obvious dementia but if we give certain drugs then these these may be suddenly develop especially in drugs like uh, cholinergic drugs like if we give anti cholinergic medication to an elderly population then or even benzodiazepines they are some of the drugs uh, which may uncover uh, incipient dementia in some patient so as far as risk factors are concerned again i would like to recapitulate the common risk factors for mi or stroke these are the risk factors which are eventually if at all modifiable these are the risk factors which need to be taken care of during the early stages during the middle ages and if hopefully these steps will uh, prevent or delay the onset of dementia in elderly patients thank you dr sumit for a elaborate answer and uh, our how we can modify the risk factors uh, for alzheimer's disease and uh, now we move to the second round of questions my next question is to dr praveen gupta from fortis gurgaon what are the treatment options uh, both pharmacological and therapeutic which are available in india for management of alzheimer's disease patients so once the diagnosis has been established how do we approach in treating them especially the pharmacological aspects and other therapeutic aspects over to dr praveen please so we have uh, availability of many medicines as we have asked in our country which can help to treat alzheimer's disease but these medicines may not they are not curative they do not change the pathophysiology or the cause of alzheimer's disease as alzheimer disease happens largely due to the deficiency of acetylcholine in the brain these medicines are largely cholinesterase inhibitors which increase acetylcholine levels in the brain and they help the brain to function better in certain patients they can improve the memory but in certain other patients they do not improve the memory but they actually keep it stable or in many other patients they only decrease the rate of deterioration of dementia there are multiple optional medicines at this time and there are three types of cholinesterase inhibitors which are largely available which is donepezil which is given as a tablet the second is rivastigmine which is available both as a patch and a tablet and third is galantamine all three are available in india are not very expensive except for the patch of rivastigmine another medicine that can be used as an adjunct in treatment of dementia along with these medicines is a drug called memanti the major side effect of these medicines may be drowsiness nausea and severe acidity so that is why they are started at a low dose and gradually increase the dose of these medications for patients with vitamin deficiency supplementation of vitamins may help if somebody has renal dysfunction or some other concomitant trouble trying to improve the biochemical profile of patient or improve the thyroid function may also help there are multiple other herbal type of medicines which are available like ginkgo biloba whose role is not very very clear in the management of dementia though they may help certain people for a small period of time now injectable medicines have also found research and approval but they are not available in our country at this point of time however apart from medicine social and psychological rehabilitation of the patient is very very important for treatment of dementia and is often neglected by us physicians and the family members also so patient needs engagement 
participation in social activity, intellectually stimulating activity, cognitive behavior therapy, which can work on the mind of people to try and rehabilitate them in their family, give them a good quality of life and help them. So this also is a major component of therapy. There are studies which show that yoga and meditation also help in the treatment of dementia. So that is easily available in our country and we can try it. There are multiple researches going on the effect of yoga and meditation in treatment of dementia. Thank you. Dr. Praveen, for a very nice exposition of what are the treatment options uh, we have for treatment of Alzheimer's disease in India. Now, my next question is to Dr. Sumit Kumar from Kanpur. Uh, uh, what are the bur current burden of Alzheimer's disease in India and how can government uh, can help in reducing this burden of Alzheimer's disease both currently and prospectively? Over to Sumit. Uh, uh, if we consider the burden of Alzheimer's disease in India, I think currently we have around 5 million people of uh, Alzheimer's and various other dementia in our country at present. And that number is supposed to increase to around 30 million, or sorry, 7.5 million in next uh, 5 to 7 years. So uh, that is a huge number of, uh, of people. But if we, if we see, look at the demographic profile of such patients, they are mostly elderly. And if we think... Uh, from the government point of view, they might be considered as some, some a group of population which is not very productive. So, but still it is a, a vulnerable group, a group which needs the support of the government. So, uh, I think as far as uh, the gov role of government is concerned, uh, there is a mental health care act which protects the uh, the rights and and rules of these, this group of people who are, uh, say, in the 70s or the 80s. So uh, the role of government, as far as I, I feel, is, is to increase awareness of the group of uh, the disease. I think uh, still in our country, there are hardly uh, medical colleges with departments of, say, geriatrics or neurology. So uh, I think it is considered that up to 70 to 80 percent of uh, all dementia or Alzheimer's patients are undiagnosed. So they are considered the, uh, just an old age disease or something like that, despite the fact that a patient who is diagnosed early in the case of Alzheimer's can survive for up to 15 or even 20 years. So the burden of disability is very, very high with a very prolonged uh, time for which the patient will be sick, but he'll be alive and uh, there is a distinct, very heavy load on caregivers. So I think the first thing uh, which the government should uh, try to do is to, in to increase the awareness of the disease and also maybe establish some memory clinics or department of geriatrics or neurology in various medical colleges so that we are able to identify and diagnose the patient so unless we diagnose the patient we are not going to treat the question of treatment comes very secondary and uh, probably that is one area which is very very important that unless we have people who can diagnose then only we can treat such patients second is uh, i think uh, even if we are not able to have uh, very strict uh, consultants or, or uh, specialists who are able to diagnose, we can still establish uh, screening clinics or uh, we can teach uh, some, uh, even at PHP level or government district level, we can teach the uh, doctors there about the screening of dementia. I mean, MMS is something which can be done even by uh, a non-medical medical person. So by increasing the awareness and thereby by increasing the, uh, the uh, diagnosis of patient, hopefully, the 90 percent who are not diagnosed probably we can first of all diagnose the patients and the role of government is definitely at that point is very very important thank you dr sumit uh, for uh, this lovely answer and now my next question uh, goes to professor sanjeev das sir of a gpgi sir what is the role of support groups and how can they help us in managing the Alzheimer's disease because we cannot leave it all at the, at the door of the government. Government has only a role to play in policy and in establishing maybe small centers in nearby areas. 
but support has to be provided to the individuals, to the sufferers, to the caregivers. How can support group help us? Please elaborate, sir. What do you say? Uh, since a lot of time is left, uh, I'll be very uh, like to share my experience uh, regarding uh, dementia. Not only with dementia, I tell the following to the, my patients and the caregiver, caregivers. Not only about dementia, but also other disabling diseases like uh, Parkinson's, like uh, <clears throat> like motor neuron disease, Huntington disease, disabling diseases, which are relentlessly progressive. And which seem to have no treatment as thing as things stand today. This whatever I am going to speak now, um, um, now is more about the degenerative disorders of the brain, which is applicable also to patients like of motor neuron disease, uh, like uh, Parkinson disease, Huntington disease, degenerative genetic disorders, and including dementia and Alzheimer. The most important thing uh, is that. Uh, uh, let us encourage the patients, as Dr. Praveen said, and his uh, his points were very illuminating. Dr. Praveen, salu I salute you for your wonderful points, which I have always in my mind, uh, and I've been there with over the last 40 years, they've been with me. Number one, encourage the caretakers <coughs> to get the patient investigated as much as keep the investigation machinery in full throttle. The investigation machine sometimes seem to revolutionize the treatment. <coughs> the treatment uh, in neurology has been revolutionized. Uh, I joined uh, neurology over 30 years back, the department of neurology over 30 years back. At that time, there seemed to be very few investigations available for, uh, including MRI or budding. What I've seen, encourage the patient's attendant to go ahead with investigation. Spare no efforts to rule out a treatable cause. Spare no efforts to say. Sometimes they may you be in for a very big surprise. For example, you get a B12 estimation done, which is not very expensive. You get an MRI done. Sometimes you find a subdural hematoma. Sometimes you find a normal pressure hydrocephalus. Right? So, spare number one, spare no efforts in uh, establishing a treatable cause. Sometimes, all, not all patients of dementia are non-treatable. Like vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, vitamin B6, sometimes some other uh, nutritional deficiency, metabolic deficiency problem may be there. One. Number two, as Dr. Praveen rightly pointed out, I am I salute this point of his, go ahead with the treatment. And as Dr. Sumit also said, I go ahead with the treatment, and uh, actually in India, you, uh, there's a time where this uh, medicines are very harmful to the kidneys. They are very harmful to the heart. Garam dawai, traditional speaking. Garam dawai, garam dawai. I encourage the patient to stick to treatment. Like as Dr. Praveen rightly said, that I I go ahead with reverse treatment, including factors. You see, let us uh, um, not spare any efforts to treat the patient also. Like Rivastigmin, I give cerebral proteins also, I give donopril, and agree with Dr. Praveen that we should last in very low dose. We should uh, actually, uh, th these family caretakers are the main backbone of treatment in neurology at least. Not in cardiology, but in other branches, the patient has to take but in neurology, the backbone. Oh, I'm very important about this point. Uh, often my uh, my uh, peers, they wonder what I give more time to attendants. That they are the backbone of treatment in neurology. <clears throat> and irrespective of the diseases, including epileptics. So spare no efforts in diagnosing a treatable cause. <coughs> Spare no effort in treatment. Start with small doses. Third, third is any side effects report to the clinician. Fourth is form a team. There's no harm. I believe a lot in team effort. I believe a lot in team effort. Uh, I believe that the important members of my team are the physiotherapist. The physiotherapist is a very important member of a neurology team, which we tend to uh, just uh, overlook. The physiotherapist, uh, because I have yet to see a patient die of dementia or Alzheimer's. They die of septicemia, multiple traumas, resulting catabolism. They die of pneumonitis. 
to if uh, you take the help of a physiotherapist who will give uh, tell them how to avoid back pains they are very important components of treatment because no patient of dementia or motor nerve they die of they die of the complications like the most important thing is trauma number two pneumonitis infection septicemia bad abdomen third thing is take the help of a psychiatrist we hesitate a lot especially we neurology take a lot of uh, problem a lot of uh, dealing with the uh, psychiatric patient and we give our medicine but they are specialized trained people and they can help you a lot right so they are, the care takers are, are, are going to the two things which i my observation say to caregivers and uh, that is keep the patient as active as possible let him do his normal job the activity of daily routine you <clears throat> don't over help him ask him to get a spoon for himself ask him to put on uh, switch on the light himself also ask him to keep him involved let him not feel worthy uh, uh, worthless right and it is this depression that kills the patient he feels that he not no use for society now and that is really trust me uh, my experience uh, in australia was that uh, when people uh, leave their home to go for those what you call that old age home and they uh, you see, observe them after one month sorry as a deteriorate like anything they just buzz off mil aisa lagta hai they are about to die they are about to perish so social background is very important uh, in australia what to do as soon as the patient become disabled and dependent over dependent they have to sell off everything and go to government uh, help page homes there massive deterioration occurs just in a couple of months you trust me so what i must emphasize the research and rightly pointed by dr praveen and dr me that social social help is very 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 important like i remember one of my very close relative my father in law i used to share jokes with him and used to laugh like anything i used to ask him for money he just sorry there just petrol dalwa dijiye aap to he used to feel very good he used to feel that he still of use to society and this is the important point to avoid nihilism in the care caregiver are nothing can be done he's dead this is not only applicable for alzheimer also but i have seen patients of motor neuron disease survive decades trust me just by and he live a very long time just avoid for him uh, traumas especially at bed time traumas are very common at bed time i must uh, say that keep the patient as active as possible physically and mentally mentally and avoid trauma especially in during the nocturnal time where patient is very susceptible to falling and develop fractures and all two things again i repeat keep the patient mentally socially very independent and very active avoid trauma trauma and take the help of physiotherapist the psychiatrist and the other peers and they the wonders will work out thank and you dr sanjay i agree with dr praveen in that keep the therapeutic and the investigative machinery in full gear therapeutic 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 i don't hesitate in giving reverse segment dono pedal trials no trials in few trials they have found to be very effective and my personal experience with these drugs is very good and they are not very expensive they are at least cheaper than um, what you call as pizza and all these they were quite cheap reasonably cheap and every tom dick and harry can easily afford them go out for investigation go out for therapeutics and keep the uh, keep a team of thank you dr sanjeev sir for this elaborate answer i couldn't agree with you more uh, i would fully agree with you that the best place of treatment for patients of alzheimer's disease is at home with the patient's relatives with their caregivers but unfortunately as india has moved on from joint families to nuclear families support group numbers have got reduced so that the support system is missing at homes so i would wish even though individual liberties are curtailed in joint family system i would strongly recommend in those patients of alzheimer's disease they should go back to joint family system because they have they can 
we provided audio and visual stimulation from small children's from their sons for the in-laws from the uh, siblings from their relatives second degree cousins third degree uh, nephews and so they can all help because so much audio stimulation can be possible inside a home which is not possible if they are shifted to any hospice or any uh, old age homes so many people go there only because they think that no one is looking after them at home but if someone is there to look for them at home nothing like it apart from this sometimes there is a real issue with nuclear families when there is only wife to look after and in such cases there is a great deal of for support groups especially i would uh, recommend we have uh, alzheimer's disease international is a self support group we have in different parts of india in different cities different towns and in, in fact every memory clinic or alzheimer's disease clinic run by us we do encourage people who have alzheimer's disease or dementia or maybe of different etiology but they can club themselves together they can have joint outings they can meet with each other and they can share their sufferings their ways to cope up with the uh, disease and how they have managed them so simplistic tools and uh, takeaways can be a great help to the in general all the patients who have alzheimer's disease or support so support groups are of very importance and especially uh, we should recommend alzheimer's disease international and other support groups in our vicinity so i will move on to our next topic though there are n number of topics uh, we can go on and on for hours and end i think we have left out uh, one important aspect is the mild cognitive impairment which which almost 70% of patients are going on to uh, develop alzheimer's disease so we will discuss that after my next question so uh, this question is to uh, dr pravin gupta uh, mild cognitive impairment uh, how do you uh, see this as an entity and how to approach patients with mild cognitive impairment so mild cognitive impairment in elderly people is very very common as we discuss that there are differences not every cognitive decline or every forgetfulness is dementia dementia is more like a progressive memory impairment cognitive impairment which troubles with your activities of daily living but lot of elderly have some age associated cognitive decline which when it becomes more qualifies as mild cognitive impairment my cognitive impairment is seen as minor defi- deficiencies in the test of memory commonly uh, your tests both biochemical the mris and others should be normal they should not indicate a specific disorder of metabolism or of structure of the brain the disease is mild and it is non progressive usually but a large number of people with mild cognitive impairment if they are followed for many, many years and decades will progress to dementia there are studies which suggest that if we intervene at the level of mild cognitive impairment we can actually prevent some of these patients from cro- crossing over to dementia or we can delay the development of dementia in such patients in my opinion because of the limited effect of medications in patients with dementia and limited repertoire to help those patients to in, to find and intervene these patients at this stage is more important and in my donepezil is actually i have some research data to actually suggest some benefit in mild cognitive impairment also and as dr jha emphasized for a patient statistics is not important for a patient to get a medicine from a doctor which makes his current problem better or quality of life better is most important so we should try intervening with therapeutics where it is indicated plus all other things like stimulation socialization giving support maintaining stimulating activities learning trying and learning new things which engage the patient 
we should start these activities at the stage of mild cognitive impairment itself and not wait for somebody to become demented to intervene because these in investigations can actually improve our own quality of life because once you develop dementia it's not a disease of the patient dementia is a disease of the complete household where caregivers attendants family members are as badly affected as the patient sometimes even more so so whatever we can do at this stage to make the quality of life of people better that is most rewarding even more than more rewarding than treatment of dementia also yes thank you uh, dr pravin for this uh, elaborate answer so uh, i will uh, go on to my next question uh, alzheimer's disease uh, as we all know uh, has we don't have a complete cure for it but the research into the treatment process is going on and uh, so i will ask dr anil anil kumar jha from patna paras hospital to elaborate on what what the future is holding for approach to alzheimer's disease treatments and what are the new research which is going on how we can help the patient with alzheimer's disease in future so what dr anil Uh, thank, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for bringing this uh, burning topic of the issues uh, research related to the research in Alzheimer's disease, which are uh, actually ongoing. Uh, so, as we know, uh, and it has been discussed that the mainstay of treatments are the volume stress inhibitors and the NMDA receptor antagonist. They are the potential uh, means for excitotoxicity that has to be taken care of. or along with the combination of these drugs and as well as the treatment of the behavioral and the psychological symptoms of the alzheimer's disease so that is what we are doing uh, till date and uh, what future holds for uh, this alzheimer's disease is can we uh, actually the challenge is actually can we pick it up early and the treatment also targets mainly related to the pathophysiology of the alzheimer's disease so as we know that the main uh, you know the pathophysiology of alzheimer's is the uh, predominantly this uh, amyloid and the tau protein and this amyloid hypothesis uh, where it is said that this amyloid beta production that inhibits or the cascade that leads to the alzheimer's disease and these novel treatments that are targeted are also uh, that aim to interfere with the pathogenic steps and these pathogenic steps are only these the forming of this amyloid oligomers and this amyloid cascade and then the local uh, inflammation oxidation excitotoxicity and this tau hypo uh, hyper uh, phosphorylation so basically amyloid beta and tau they are the prime targets of the disease modifying therapies that we are looking for and then preventing the ag uh, aggregation of these uh, misfolding of these uh, proteins and are the neutralizing uh, or uh, this uh, removing these toxic aggregates or misfolded forms of these proteins or the combination of all these things so these are the things that we are targeting and the drugs that can interfere with uh, amyloid beta aggregation uh, like the newer molecules that are being trialed are uh, tranexoprostein colosoprostein and these are the some of, some of the rare other molecules also and yes. also the selective a beta 42 lowering agents or the newer one that is immuno uh, therapy or the monoclonal antibodies of which the uh, one monoclonal antibody that has already been uh, approved is the adu canumab which is already uh, marketed also though not available in our country but actually available and then the anti inflammatory drugs as in discussion also said that the risk factors uh, related to this uh, modification in the cholesterol or the vascular related risk factors they are also uh, you know uh, being projected as the uh, future therapies as the statins are as the vitamin uh, supplementations are and the molecules that are addressing the oxidative change they are also uh, being investigated so the basically the future holds for uh, targeting these 
patho uh, physiology or the pathological steps that is the amyloid beta and the tau that is the targeted thing that is the target thing and also early uh, pickup of these molecules with the biomarkers especially the biomarkers of beta amyloid and the phosphor tau these are these can be a biomarkers and the challenge the whole challenge is to neuroprotective and can we act early by modifying these agents in the pre symptomatic stage so the future holds in uh, picking up early the alzheimer's disease and targeting these uh, uh, abnormal uh, molecules which are you know uh, basically uh, causing the disease so uh, that that is the future holds for us thank you dr anil for a very elaborate answer into what the future holds for the therapy for alzheimer's disease as i can understand in future uh, it will not be just like we have ct scans and mri for the brain we can have scans of the brain looking at the amyloids proteins and the tau which are now available only in very advanced mri centers of the world in us and uk in future maybe it will be easily available so that we can uh, pick the, these cases up much earlier so much has been discussed today about what are the how do we diagnose a patient of alzheimer's disease and dementia how do we uh, look at the risk factors how we go about the therapy for these patients much has been said about the care for the alzheimer's disease patients now one last question it is to dr sumit kumar as to we have discussed in detail about the treatment of alzheimer's disease and the alzheimer's disease patients how to look after the caregivers the caregivers who provide the main burden of looking after patients with alzheimer's disease how do we help out look out educate and help the caregivers care for the caregivers over to dr sumit please unmute yourself sumit so as we discussed the treatment of alzheimer's disease we have understood that uh, the treatment does not entirely depend only on the patient so the treatment part is actually uh, inclusive of all the caregivers who are actually taking care of the patient because treatment cannot be or is never only say therapeutic or only pharmacy related it is the care of the mind of the patient and not only mind of the patient but also of the caregivers because it is as i've already said the disease is not for days months it can be for years and to have patience for the patients as well as the caregiver to 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 take care of a, of a progressively debilitating patient a person who say one year back was able to walk to bathroom but not understanding and after one year he is restricted to the bed so how to take care of such a patient who is progressively worsening and despite all the best of medications he is progressively worsening and even the doctors are saying that this is the course of the disease so as i said not only of treatment for the patient and we all know that even the best of the medications they are not going to reverse the disease process so the role of people who i mean there is the role of caregiver associations and other things which not only will take care of the patient but also help the caregivers to take better care of the the patient himself so i think it is equally important that the caregivers they are explained in full detail the nature and course of illness what we expect out of the disease how the disease will progress and how even the best of the medication the disease is going to take a particular course of time so that understanding should be given to the patients caregivers and for that as the sir was also uh, talking about we should establish specific alzheimer's or dementia related caregiver groups which are uh, widely available in uh, the western country so even in india those groups those support groups not only uh, with respect to treatment but also psych psychology psychiatrist and as jhasar was saying uh, the role of physiotherapist and other this whole team a group of people should be inculcated for a long term treatment of uh, alzheimer's patient and also to take care of the caregivers thank you dr sumit uh, for elaborating any more tips uh, from dr pravin gupta or how to look after caregivers please unmute yourself pravin 
possibly one of the most important questions because as we look at the patients of dementia looking at caregiver is more important because this strain can actually affect their current life their vocation and ongoing life thereafter also so we should actually spend time in our clinic when we see a patient with dementia at caregiver himself whether the caregiver is feeling some low feeling depression he is overburdened he is not able to spend time so we should actually use people who can give caregiver relief so couple of hours a day there are associations who send people at home for dementia patients so that caregiver can take off for some time so that caregiver is able to rejuvenate his energies second caregiver counseling on what to expect at what stage what dependence is required is very important third home care for these patients as dr sumit said when they become bed bound they are no longer able to look after the self care activities arranging home cares like attendants nursing staff to give injections feeding uh, rice tube sometimes in the end stages to make all that available for caregivers is very very important and there are support groups which can help caregiver uh, to fulfill these requirements unfortunately we, the caregivers do not have access to those support groups so it is part of our duty to actually help caregiver access those supports for him to access psychologists who seeing the patient for counseling and better understanding of how to deal with trouble things like hallucinations hyperactive behavior withdrawal because caregivers have really tough time understanding the patient behavior and change in personality that the patient has they have seen their father as a very robust gentleman they can't see him misbehaving or as a withdrawn person so to address all these things is equally important because dementia may or may not improve but looking after caregiver health can get them a great feeling they, it can allow them to take better care of dementia patients and come out of this illness in better health thank you sir thank you thank you dr praveen now sir over to dr sanjeev jha sir please uh, can you give some tips as to how we can take care of the caregivers Uh, one important thing which i want to tell you by sharing a small example just to yes, herald sir. my point uh, what is the role of university? i because there is sufficient time four minutes left i'll tell you one yes. small case both anil and sumit have been a part of sgpgi and they know that uh, we have got a brilliant residents group of brilliant residents there uh, i we had a small young patient uh, somewhere about the 50s 50 year old gentle lady she was a lady and she presented with dementia all the investigation including mri of the <coughs> brain was normal the mri uh, everything was normal all b12 level palana level and this and that. somehow i don't know in spite of all the investigation somehow i don't know why uh, the resident um, uh, and as sumit and anil will agree that uh, some uh, really a brilliant residents are there it was not my um, i could not view that patient that way. i just simply thought that the patient is having a dementia of unknown etiology because since the mri was absolutely normal all investigation were normal except for uh, dementia the patient had which was to be honest not very progressive which was not relentlessly progressive it was very slowly progressive and uh, somehow the patient could the resident could pick out something in the cranium the cranium was reported as normal by the uh, by the radiologists they got a mri of the spine done and there they found something in the spinal cord which was sub, uh, something suggestive of what you call a copper deficiency resulting in subacute combined degeneration institution of copper within a uh, few weeks the patient was absolutely normal the dementia has virtually vanished and i don't know myself whether to call it dementia or not but the, uh, there was a first case which after that i have seen two cases of undiagnosed dementia which got cured and uh, got reversed by institution of i have seen two cases of which are picked up in uh, mri with the spine the subacute combined degeneration resulting in dementia and the cause of the subacute combined degeneration was not b12 this time it was copper so this is where uh, you should go out very well with the therapeutic machinery and the investigation and as rightly pointed by dr praveen he said more than yoga pranayam walking sunlight and uh, yes, care care for the we can make the life less miserable that's what let us give in our best 
for every neurodegenerative disorder not only for this for every ne- neurodegenerative let us for example in motor neurons i give relo reluton i give that uh, what idara won i give and with with a really satisfactory level i agree with dr pravin at every step that uh, therapeutic machinery the investigation machinery full gear full throttle let us light a candle rather than curse the darkness thank you dr sanjeev ji sir uh, you have shared a gold mine of experience and uh, i think that that uh, i would like to highlight this that in any case of dementia before we level the patient as suffering from alzheimers we must look at all the available different causes of treatable Uh, causes of dementia and look at all the rare causes especially the heavy metal poisoning especially in india in rural setting we we have to look at them and uh, nutritional vitamin deficiency these are easily correctable so that should be our goal motto that these can be treated well but then we have to suffer we have to endure we have to tender loving care myself and project pravin we come from mems we also had this tender loving care attitude towards all dementia patients and their caregivers so that should be the motto on this note i think i would like to end this today's discussion it was a very elaborate detailed discussion on the different aspects of alzheimer's disease dementia i would like to thank you all for joining me now over to dr asavari sawant for the thanks session thank you thank you sir uh and so wisely said let us give in our best let us give in our all as so as to uh, prolong the life of the patients that we are doing so much for with that we wrap up this uber informative session thank you to all our esteemed panelists our partners and all our viewers for staying with us till the end we greatly value your time and i hope This session was just as enlightening and interesting as hosting it was for us. We truly hope that a good awareness was generated regarding management of Alzheimer's disease through this talk and that in future we have more advanced methods of treatment. With that, we are going to sign off now. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Namaste all. Thank you.